Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another Office Hour session. We have, let's see, we have Chris Jones here, Anthony Tuninga, as well as Blaine Carter here to answer any and all of your questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature of Zoom and feed us questions at any time during the presentation or the session, and we'll take them as soon as we can get to them. So we had a new release of Node Oracle DB just a little while ago. How long ago was that, Chris? Yeah, exactly. How long ago was it? It seems, <laughs> seems like yesterday. That June it 7th. really does. <laughs> <laughs> June 7th, there's the official answer. Yeah, a month ago. And it had some nice features. Some of those features were related specifically to connections and connection pooling, which is a topic we actually covered in the very first office hour session, but we're going to revisit the topic because that release added some new features that are worth talking about and may help with your applications. So why don't you tell us about those features, Chris? What did we get? What was new? Uh, what was new? That's a question because we just had a Python release yesterday, Python 6 Oracle release yesterday, so my brain is... Uh, ah, crossing the wires. Like that. And I just I'd ask Anthony, up, but... <laughs> I'll pop up the, uh, the change log. And we can see if we can share that down here. So the, the big thing was to change notification, of course, which I kind of blogged and talked about a little bit. So change notification is a way to get events out of the database when database data changes. And it was possible to kind of do some callback method with HTTP because the database can, can make an HTTP request. But this is much nicer. You just nominate a JavaScript function, which gets called whenever data is, data is changed, updated. Um, it's quite fully featured. I'm not going to go into details now. Uh, but the, the big pooling thing that you're talking about, of course, is this uh, heterogeneous pool support. Heterogeneous meaning not the same. So you can have a connection pool where each connection in that pool doesn't have the same credentials. It's still a pool to the one database service. So you, you, you know, have that uber limitation, that upper limitation. But within that connection pool, you can decide who is connected, what database authentication occurs, and you have things like proxy support, which some people find useful if they're doing data modeling where one user owns the schema, but other people need to access it, and they're using database authentication to control that and for auditing reasons, and et cetera, et cetera, whatever weird and wonderful things you developers love doing. And then there were some, some other smaller changes, uh, but those are the, the two big things. And there's certainly a, a couple of blog posts I've put out there um, on this and Dan, you've got some older stuff up there. I think you're going to update at some stage. Oh yeah, at some stage. <laughs> yeah. So stage. let me share my screen if it's all right sure. by you. Mm -hmm. I won't spend a lot of time on this. As I said before, we, we've already covered connections in general, but just as a quick recap, what I have here is what you should not be doing, especially if you're creating web servers. So you're taking in multiple HTTP requests that you need to serve some kind of data from. So you got to connect to the database. Uh, you do not want to use one-off connections as this example demonstrates. So here on, let me blow this up so everyone's able to see it all right. So here I'm bringing in the driver and I'm bringing in dbconfig1. So I'll show you that real fast. Here's dbconfig1. So I'm connecting as a user named schema1. You can imagine schema1 owns lots of perhaps tables, could be packages, different objects that we need for our application. You see the password in the connect string and the pool settings like the pool min and max here, they're the same, pool increment zero. So we have a fixed pool size here, just five connections to the database. So we bring that in and this little test here, what it does is goes into a loop a hundred times and what we're doing is getting a connection to the database using that configuration I just pointed you to. So this is that one-off connection. We get the connection and then immediately close the connection to the database. So we do that a bunch of times, 100 times, and what we get is takes about three and a half seconds to run. So not terrible considering that it is 100 different connections, actually 101 if I'm reading my equals right there, but you get the idea. This is bad. Do not do this. What you need to be doing is using a connection pool. So that's where we go next. And this file's named homogeneous because when they added this 
feature, you know, heter heterogeneous and homogeneous are opposites. So there was some discussion about which name should be used for which, uh, which I'll, I'll point out here in just a second. But again, uh, because it's a standard pool, I'm bringing in the same configuration you saw before, config one. The difference here is really line five. Now, before I go into this loop, I create a pool using that, that same config you saw. And then in here, I don't get the connection from the base class, but rather I get it from the pool instead. And then I immediately invoke close on it. The difference is that in this case, we're not truly closing the connection to the database. Instead, we're simply releasing the connection back to the pool so others can use it to execute their code. Can you just show us the DB config so we can see the Ooh. pool configurations? Of course, yep. So oh, the pool no. has various settings. It's right there, yeah. Yeah, I just have Zoom windows <laughs> getting in my way. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So therefore, you start, you've got pool max, pool min, five. So you're starting, when the pool starts, it will create five connections to mm -hmm. the database. Those. Yeah, but to be fair, I create the pool outside of the start time. So I'm not trying to measure the time it takes to instantiate the pool, but so, rather just uh, to run it. All right, so we run example two, and we're down to 17 milliseconds. So as I, as I just mentioned, right, we're not measuring the time it actually takes to create the initial five connections, but rather just how many times does it take us to get and then release a connection? And it's almost uh, zero, right? Practically undetectable. So we've eliminated the overhead associated with getting, creating connections, I should say, which is spawning processes, allocating memory, and so on and so forth. So definitely a step up. One, I should say, one of the issues you may run into as your applications scale or become more complex over time. You know, the way we're looking at things right now, this is perhaps as far as most folks will ever need to go. You're going to have a standard homogeneous connection pool with Node Oracle DB creating dedicated connections to the database. And that's it. You're done. But for complex applications, you may need to connect to more than one schema in the database. Now, if we use the standard pool here, then you have some decisions to make. So we'll take a look at getting into a heterogeneous pool. But before, I want to show you just the config file that it uses. So this is something like where you got to connect to two separate users. And, and you can set up your configs like this. But when you think about it, your pool settings for separate users would normally be in line with each user. And so what you're doing is truly creating two separate pools with a pool min of five uh, for each pool. So really you're establishing 10 connections to the database. And if they're both used uh, quite a lot, I suppose it's not a big deal, but the overhead associated with that, if it could be avoided, that would be better. And that's where these heterogeneous pools come in. Am I saying all this right, Anthony? Yep. So far so good? Yep. Nothing to correct? All right, I'll take it. <laughs> so, so if we look at heterogeneous pools, I'm bringing in that DB config too, and I'll revisit that in just a moment. But now I'm creating a pool and I'm passing in pool specific options. And as you'll see in a moment, that does not include the username and the password. It's sort of a, a generic connection that I'm doing to the database. And then inside the loop, we're getting a little bit more complex here, depending on the iteration, even or odd, I'm gonna get a connection from either schema one or schema two. So now you can see we're using the same connection pool with two different users, and here's that config file. So all the pool-related information, including the connect string to actually get to the database, we're putting in, in pool ops. And then for each individual schema, now all I need is the name and password for the individual schemas. So if we run node three, you can see that we've added a little bit of overhead here which is really just associated with the actual authentication process because you know we do have to check the credentials, username and password that were passed in. But compared to you know just creating these connections over and over, we're still doing great, right? This is still uh, a very performant connection pool. Only now we can better balance the, the needs when we need to connect with multiple schemas to the database. And uh, let me jump real quick to the doc on this. I apologize if, Chris, you were going to show this in a moment, but I'm just going to dive in. So hopefully everybody knows how to get to the doc already. Just go to github.com and find our repo. 
if you scroll down a bit and click okay. on the documentation link. Oh, okay. That's Actually, Dan, one. it would be better for you. Oh, yeah, that one. Okay, yeah. 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 Hey, yeah. I'm <laughs> using the right <laughs> <Okay>. doc. <laughs> okay. So far, so good. So let's see here. I will search for heterogeneous, and we can click that and skip down to the doc. So we just looked at heterogeneous pools. The next one I'm going to show you, if we scroll down a bit more, is something called pool proxy authentication. Now, this one's a bit unique in that you're going to connect to the database using a certain user, uh, which is a little different from what we uh, previously saw. And that particular user is going to have some grants. So here we have a session user, and you can think of this as your application user, the owner of the objects. And there may be multiple of these, as we have in our example, schema one and schema two. So we're saying alter schema one or schema two and grant the ability to connect through some proxy user. Now the proxy user is typically thought of as an application level user, oftentimes a user specifically created for one application and only one application. And uh, I'll show you how this works. So moving on to proxy auth. Now I'm coming into a configuration three. So this varies a bit more. We're going back now to a single user so I have my application user created specifically for this demo. And my pool min and max still just five connections, so I'm not doubling up the pool size. But I did have to do these grants ahead of time. So schema one and schema two, this particular user can connect as that user. And then in the actual code, what changes now when we call get connection, you have to pass an object, but the only property required is user. And then you can pass a string indicating the user you want to connect as. So we'll give this one a quick test. Takes, hmm, I was actually surprised by that. Should have been about the same as three. Yeah, there you go. As you can see, compared to the original, you know, where we're not using a connection pool at all, you're still getting a really nice boost using any of the connection pools you just have a lot more flexibility. And, and frankly, I didn't cover it all. I'm surprised Chris didn't call me out already. <laughs> there are various ways you can use this proxy auth. The example you saw me do, I'm not passing in the password each time I'm calling get connection, although that is an option if, if for whatever reason you want to. There's different ways you can, you can leverage the proxy auth as well. Is that, is that right? Am I touching all the right bases? So here, here you go with the get connection and you're, you're specifying your, your proxy user a little bit, or the actual uh, owner, object owner, a little bit differently, and the password. Personally, I don't find this advantageous, so I like to leave it out, but this is an option if it's necessary in your environment. Cool, thanks, Dan. Is it time what to did just, I uh, just do a quick status check and tell people there's a chat button somewhere on their screens. If they want to ask questions, they can probably click the, the chat and just ask him, we're obviously open to any kinds of questions. We just have this icebreaker theme. We're going to do, um, you know, connection management kind of came up during the month. Thought we'd, we'd cover it. Always a topic of discussion. But uh, yeah, yell out if you do want to ask anything and we can <laughs> hang around later, obviously. Of course. So I have a little bit of discussion about when to use a pool and when not based on that GitHub issue, which was open during the month. We can go into that if you want, Dan. Or Yeah, sounds good. Sure. Can you put okay, up on this screen? Share the screen in my fantastic non colorized text way, and I'll try and get rid of this. Zoom has a flyover, as you can probably see on your own screens. Best practices, I guess, people want to know when to use this stuff and when not to use this stuff. Always. <laughs> well, you know, there are subtleties to it. People aren't sure if you've never done it before, you know, when, how, what. And some of the stuff we can talk about, I did in text, so we can. Uh, updated as we discuss it amongst ourselves here. You, uh, people on the call might have their own comments as well. So one super tip is, as you saw with, with Dan, keep the min and the max the same. And if you go into the doc and there's a, a link to something called, uh, from the real world performance group down there, Oracle's real world performance group, it happens to link to some Java doc, but their concept is the same. And they say the issues they generally see with databases are not doing this. And if you don't do this, then users come in at the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock whenever they start in your country, and the pool has shrunk overnight down to a small number, 
and but everybody wants to start doing work but the pool is you know down to say one or whatever your, your pool mean was and suddenly the pool needs to grow so you have to create those connections and just like dan's first example you saw creating connections is actually quite expensive and so therefore the database is under load to create connections plus it's trying to do other work and basically you just get instability at the at the big end so they, they like seeing pull me and pull max the same and pull increment as you saw in dan's db config to zero the counterpart to that is you know don't don't expire sessions you know try and make sure your dba doesn't use a resource manager isn't trying to be proactive about killing sessions you know, the sessions are there for a reason they're there to do work when you need to do work we've we've seen that a lot in the issues folks getting connections killed but personally and, I, and it may just be that i've been using later versions of the driver that are accounting for some of these issues i haven't found that to be an issue in fact i was trying to reproduce the issue and i was unable i was setting up uh, sessions to be killed after a certain amount of idle time. And then what I seemed to be uh, witnessing was when I got a new connection from the pool, it seemed to reconnect just fine. I did see the database kill a session and then I go get me another connection and it reestablished the connections. Is that something yeah. that... I mean, it's, it's an issue because it's more work, but the driver is being nice and we're about to make a change as I'll show you in a minute. Um, to next version to make it, you know, get around some some more of those kinds of errors, which do, arguably we perhaps shouldn't be doing. You know, you should be seeing some of those those errors just to know that the, data, the DBA is trying to do something to you and telling you, you know, I'm killing your sessions. But we're going to make the the driver trying to more resilient, so it just works. You know, just does what I mean. Um, so yes, when you do a get connection call from a pool, there's some kind of check, and I'll, I'll get that in a, a minute. Um, Danilla has got a question there, which I'll come to, but, but yeah, we try and you know, reestablish connections that they disappeared or the pools shrunk down. If you don't have min and max the same, we try and you know, create things, just give you a working connection where possible. So it is, can be, can be hard. And one of the issues with that then, as you say, is, you know, you, you're, everything's being masked. It just works and you're not actually seeing that there's extra work being done, but uh, that's just a, a tricky problem. You need to take up with the, the database administrator when they can look at the database metrics and see how many connections are being established per unit of time with their AWR reports, the uh, automatic workload repository reports. So didn't know has got a question there on chat. Um, and what's the question? basically several instances. So by several instances, I mean several pools in the one node process. Is that right, Danilo? Yeah. Well, um, so he, he runs, if, if I remember, and, and Danilo, feel free to come in on voice. Oh, you do so. yeah. yeah, but That's he runs, better. there he is, go ahead. <laughs> um, one of the issues that we have is that for us, I mean, most applications right now, they're doing containers. So we're going to have, let's say four instances at a time, maybe eight instances. And the general math that you guys suggest is that we have eight connections per CPU, if I'm not mistaken. So let's say if you have just one container that's 64, then fine. I think in that one container scenario, it's okay to leave home min and home max at 64. But when you get into cloud situations, as I have, it's 64 times the amount of containers that I have. So in in my intuition, it would be it would make sense to leave the pool to a lesser amount than the pool max. So at least I can free up some of the resources in case my system not being heavily used. Yeah. I don't know. If it makes sense to leave the pool numbers the same when I'm running several containers at once at the same time. You yeah, no, that's, it, a, that's an excellent question. And I mean, it's there for a reason that those, those parameters are there for a reason. So you can juggle them as you need to juggle them. I, I'd have to ask whether or not your applications need to be available all the time, which is a scenario I was talking about where you just want them to be ready to handle work when that load starts. You know, if, you, if that's not true, then maybe, yes, you do want to shrink the pool min down. Or if you're, you know, there's small apps with not a lot of load where connection time maybe doesn't matter too much. Yes, you know, keep pool min small, let database resources be used for other things. Yeah, you know, for the web service case where you've got lots of different small web services doing doing things, um, yeah, you could could keep pull in small for you know to allow the pools to shrink when they're not so being used. So I would add. Well, let's start with that number of eight per core because if I remember correctly, the suggestion was somewhere between one and eight connections per core, right? So finding that sweet spot is going to depend, of course, on your workload, your system, 
uh, but it's between one and eight, eight being the max. And I think the solution for your problem, or at least something I would love for you to kick the tires on is database resident connection pooling. So if you, if you have that sweet spot of the number of connections, let's say it's 64 in your example, what you can do is start up DRCP, database resident connection pooling, with a pool of 64 connections. And then what you end up getting uh, when a connection is established to the database, uh, it's really kind of established to, forget the correct term, but something like a proxy. And then, so you're, you're essentially pooling now on both sides. So you can get some flexibility that way and keep your actual connections to the database lower than they would otherwise be, but maybe get more uh, CPU utilization on, on your application server. Of course, depending on your workload and how you're, how you're distributing that load. But I would love it if perhaps in a follow-up or in a future office hour session, if you could kick the tires with DRCP and feedback to us uh, how that goes for you. Yes, I guess I can try that. I mean, the sweet spot that we found right now is running four for CPU. And then we keep everything to a 64 max. So as of now, we didn't really have any problems with connections. We had a lot of problems in the past, but then I met Dan and now things are going okay. <laughs> so I can probably try something with DRCP. Something that I thought of before, but we actually need DBA involvement in that case. So it takes more time than it does, that. but and, and it's well documented. Chris Chris already covered this in the documentation. I believe it's literally two lines. I haven't looked at it in a while, but it's it's a package call to enable the pool and maybe a configuration call to set the size. It it's it's fairly trivial for them to do. Yeah, I would would counter argue and say don't use DRCP unless you're actually running out of memory. And you're saying there, Danilo, in that chat that everything's running nicely. So if everything's running nicely, then yeah, I would enough. suggest you just don't don't change it. DRCP is great when you really just have more more load than the database can handle, more, more memory is needed on the database to handle all the connections. And therefore you need to multiplex them and, and obviously use a pool of connections on the database side. So I, you almost answered your own question is what's running nicely works nicely for you within your uh, quality of service, you know, your response time goals, then go for it. So like all tuning things, you know, the answer is it depends. Yeah, right. Um, Thanks for the question. Yeah, no, it is a good question. Um, and maybe you can post that on that particular GitHub issue. I think you know the one and we can maybe discuss it more for people not on the on the call today. Let me move on because we've kind of almost, you know, half hour in out, out of our nominal half hour. We can obviously hang around for as long as you like, but uh, uh, let's just, just head on. So 12.2 client, you know, instant client, whichever way you get it, has a lightweight connection ping. Uh, now I've got my own flyover. Let me get rid of the script chat for a minute lightweight connection ping every time you do a get connection call and it, that will check for network dropouts and behind the scenes it'll you know get a new connection for you and give you back that that working connection from the, the pool get connection and i go into sort of why that that kind of stuff could happen in pools you know pools are trying to be very efficient so they're not actually checking whether connections to the database actually exist because that's extra work to be done you know you have to do a round trip so we should kind of try and avoid doing that so so you can end up with you know, what we term dead connections in the connection pool, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but that's that way when you think about it logically. In lighter versions, earlier versions, we actually did a sort of heavyweight ping. So we actually did do that round trip call to the database. And we had some kind of timed interval, this pool ping interval to not do it all the time because it is that extra overhead. And, and if you're in an active pool, you kind of know whether the connection's working because you're actually going across to the database all the time to do executions and things. So we tried to get rid of that, but there are some cases there when you know idle time, DBA has explicitly closed the error. Sorry, I was just wrapping off the screen there, but I think you get the point. Effectively, database is trying to DBA is trying to send you a message with those things, just saying, trying to tell you that hey, you're doing something naughty. I mean, it's not really that naughty, but you know, it's it's like hey, I've I've seen you've got some idle sessions. I'm killing them because I think they're just extra burden on the database. So we were passing those back, but I think just based on user feedback, we are now going to mask those. So you won't see these errors all the time. We're going to do this pull ping interval, still a time-based thing. So a few may creep in, a few errors, these errors may occur if the, the ping doesn't always occur because um, the ping only occurs every time quota. But in 3.0, which I'll get to, then we're just going to bump up the version the next release. We'll, we'll make this also available to 
all users, including those with a 12.2 client. I would still recommend using 12.2. It's got the slight weight ping, possibly set a bigger pull ping interval when you're using 12.2 or even disable it. And if you disable it, then make sure that you know you don't have any of these these things happening. Your DBA is actually aware of what the app's doing and giving you enough resources, letting you have all of those sessions in the connection pool open at the one time. Uh, that's easier to read in the doc, I think, than I've just described it. But anyway, uh, errors, network dropouts, database crashes, all those things can happen at any stage. So you're still going to need to have error handling after execute. There's just no two ways about that. You can be really smart about that if you want. You can actually try and detect some of these errors. You know, it could be these particular errors. It could be other kinds of connection errors. And you may want to then do some kind of recovery and try and get a new connection and then redo the user workload, whatever the, the SQL statements were. So you can go quite complex with that stuff. You may have PL SQL errors, which come back from the app. Uh, you might want to handle those differently as well, which is slightly unrelated to the connection management, but you know, th there may be some kinds of failures you want to, to handle in your execution error handling to redo work. So this is kind of heading towards that you know, high availability. Just give the user actual results. Don't tell them that something happened. Yes, maybe it might be a bit longer because we had to do some reconnection rework, but this is the general direction which Oracle is heading anyway at the moment. You can kind of simulate that there in your own code. We also have features in Oracle called application continuity, which is trying to do some of this in the back end, and we'll, we'll get into that more as we get some of the, the base features into the driver and start uh, doing some more documentation explanation of how that, that really will work and help you. And we have things I haven't really mentioned here about FAN. So there's another feature called FAN, uh, fast application notification. So you can switch a particular event, there's an events mode when you create a pool and you would need to configure the database to actually send these events. And this is actually useful if there's a true hardware error. This is a way for the pool to actually know that there was a database problem behind the scenes, it'll go and recreate all those connections for you. So there are multiple high availability features. A lot of the ones we're kind of talking about here with the pinging and things, we're trying to do lightweight on the application side, then you get into more complex, fast application notifications and TAF and things like that, transparent application failover, there were some high end things which you may want to get into, but you know, we're trying to avoid you needing to use all the time for base cases. The other big one, of course, is UV thread size pool. Um, so if you are increasing pool max or have multiple pools, then you're going to need to bump up thread size pool. Each of those connections can only do one thing at a time. Thread pool so, size. Yep. <laughs> and therefore, you need to bump up the number of threads available because each of those connections could block a thread and that would stop your application in its tracks and you'll see very low throughput. Don't forget there's a limit on thread pool size um, is limited to, I think it's a 128. Yep. Yep. So therefore that kind of implies that your pool max or some of all connections in the application in, in a particular node process needs to be less than 128. Uh, number of connection pools, this is kind of almost where you're heading into Nilo, not quite, I'm just gonna recenter the screen, hold on. So, we did see this question come up, people wondering what to do. Generally, most apps I see would just have one connection pool. They're just, you know, it's a web service. It's just doing one thing. It's connected to one database service. No real need for multiple connection pools. Um, Tetragenius, Dan discussed, so we don't really need to go into that. And then we have Dinlo's question really about, which was more about the database backend. How do we handle the CPU load in the database? You know, what's the, What's the number of connections per database CPU that we, we need? It's more a, a sizing question. This was, the, of course, the big thing for people coming in is what do I use that connection for once I get a connection for a pool? And Dan phrased it, you know, a give, given unit of work. You know, is this a transaction? Is this a group of selects which are going to make up a web page? Something like that. You, you want to minimize the number of times you have to do a get connection and then release a connection. Uh, within bounds, obviously, your unit you know, of work needs to be done. And the thing about connections, you know, if you're not using it, don't hog it, don't don't hold on to it unnecessarily. Exactly. So again, it depends you know, what the application needs to do. But if you had to say anything, it's you know, as Dan said, one connection for a given unit you know, of work, then release it back to the pool. So those are the sort of rough 
in the 30 minutes allocated the kind of rough guidelines for pool use. Did we miss anything in particular in there? I think that very last one, this was a recent issue that came in and it, it, it's been an issue in the past, but we saw it again recently where folks are just maybe new to Node.js and how its process and threading model works and how Oracle connections work. And the way to remember it is that a connection is a serialization device. And so just because JavaScript, the language, gives you fancy features to do uh, certain workloads in parallel, if you are trying to execute two queries using one connection, you cannot do those in parallel. One must go before the other. So even if you say promise.all, connection.execute, and you, you, know, you fire that off in a promise.all so they're being run in parallel, they're not. One's going to run, and the other is going to block. So, you know, we talked, we touched on UV thread pool size. So there's a background thread pool, and one of those threads, if it gets through uh, libuv's queue, it's going to get ready to do some work, and then it's going to see that that connection's in use, and that thread is going to block. Not going to block the main thread, but it is going to use a, a thread in the background that could be doing something more useful. So, definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, um, what else is there to say about pools? So anybody who was watching the Python CX Oracle release saw that at pool creation time, there are extra timeout parameters that can be set, which we don't have yet exposed in node.js. So those will hopefully filter through at some stage, no guarantees on any timeline there. And uh, pull requests on GitHub are welcome. And we're continuing to, to do a lot of work here in Oracle in the lower layers of things which are not um, open source the generic Oracle call interface layers, we're going to you know, make performance and improvements and feature improvements going forward as well. So there's uh, a lot to do there. The other, other thing which we didn't state about connection pools, why you should use them is because they do a lot of, they're pretty much the first place that we expose a lot of the Oracle database functionality through connections instead of the standalone connections. For example, that application continuity feature I talked about, AC, uh, that's exposed through session pooling. So that will automatically happen if you're using a session pool and, and have this thing enabled. You won't need to do anything in the application to, to get that. And we have things like the runtime load balancing. So if you are connecting across to multiple clusters of the database, you know, application clusters, then we have kind of load balancing across that and the session pool handles all of that automatically. So we definitely encourage using connection pools where possible. Danilo's getting in the last question. Sure. Is there any sort of public roadmap? We do kind of get asked this and you know open source Danilo, it's kind of all seat of the pants resource stuff which comes in. It would be nice to know what's coming in the future. So you can look at the GitHub issues list. Danilo, I thought you'd volunteered to do something recently, the uh, session close, connection close stuff. That's perhaps something we need, should talk about that um, mm -hmm. currently you need to close all connections before you can actually close a pool. And I think yeah. we were talking about uh, actually exposing the way to force close and maybe making a little bit of a draining time for people who want to give a bit of a grace period. How's that going? Um, I've been taking a look at the comments that you had on issue 8036. Um, the only concern that I'm having right now is choosing from either option one or option two because mm -hmm. I'm worried about calling the connection close on connections that are actually in use and then getting issues from the database because I can't really close them. So the close method would actually resolve, but there still would be connections on the database side that are actually alive. Yeah, we've had some discussions. We, we have our sort of weekly meeting here in, inside Oracle, just a development catch up. We've got a distributed team across multiple continents and lots going on, but we did discuss this briefly uh, in the last couple of meetings. So for people not up to speed, basically at the moment you can do a pull close, but this drain time doesn't exist and you'll get an error back if connections are being used by anybody of uh, what we call checked out if somebody's done a get connection call. We kind of want a way to be able to force that close so that the database can be notified that those sessions can be deleted and obviously free up its resources and then drain time is just a way to let the application continue running for a certain amount of time 
Uh, maybe people can just finish off a commit or whatever else they need to do before getting an error back. So the real issue is how does that all get handled if, a, if the pool is closed, those connections become unusable, but node applications, the node application still thinks, you know, it has a connection, still thinks it's going to do some work on it. How do we make sure that the no error is happening? So we have some kind of slightly complex logic in here, which only the implementator implementer really needs to know about. The rest should just work nicely for you once, once it's all exposed. So we were talking about doing some stuff in the database abstraction layer, ODPIC, which is the, the common layer which we use across a number of drivers to make sure that we protect it against, say, crashes when you had a C pointer in the memory structures that it was referring to no longer exist. But there are a number of things which can be done up in the JavaScript player with certain flags. So you can make sure that uh, another execute, can't see where it is at the moment, but uh, basically you might want to make sure that anything which is trying to execute on after the pool is being closed doesn't actually run. Yeah, there we go, execute should fail immediately. Anthony, do you want to comment on how you see it playing out? I think you've kind of <clears throat> covered it fairly well already. I think the only real question is that option one or two, which one of those is going to be the best approach regarding uh, the change, right? And then Danilo, if you're worried about doing any of the work, I mean, we're certainly available to kind of you know, contribute to whatever you're doing and obviously comment and make sure that things we need to do. Uh, we don't accept pull requests into ODPIC for various complex reasons to do with just uh, paperwork effectively, actually legal paperwork. But you know, we can make sure that we're ready with that when we're ready to merge any upper level transaction you've got in NJS layer, the Node.js layer. Yeah, that part we can do regardless, even if this ever gets implemented. <clears throat> yeah. So Danilo, more about what you're worried about. What's, what's the story? <laughs> what you guys just said makes more sense. I think that blocking any of the actions after the pool close gets called, then it will probably solve most of the issues that I was thinking, like hmm. connections lingering on the database, maybe some failure. If I tried to end a connection and sort of I just set open. I don't know the exact reasons that a connection close could fail, but, but I think there may be some cases where even trying to close each connection of the pool may fail. But if I just block everything from being run after the pool close method gets called, then it's fine. It's from the point of just draining all the connections. That might work. Yeah. The subtlety, I guess, is that people may have standalone connections as well as the pool or multiple connection pools. So we need to do a little bit of logic to the best of our abilities there to try and trap that. Obviously without uh, impacting performance, we have to juggle that whole performance versus uh, stability question. Yeah, my thought by the way was that only when you try to get a session from the pool, that's when you would get the error. Existing connections would be able to continue to execute and so forth because Normally, if you want to do a nice shutdown, graceful shutdown, you're not going to want to just have errors take place just because somebody's trying to close the pool, right? Just let the, yeah, yeah. Let, yeah, so that first comment there, using any connection should fail. Checking out a connection should fail. Now, th this is a specific case after the force has actually happened oh, when the, right. this connection has actually disappeared and isn't usable, the pool has actually closed right. it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah so there's a subtlety there. But yes, yeah, so the implicit thing is that before this, so after the, after the initial close call with a, a drain time, we use a default mode. So after, between that and this second close, then right. okay, yeah, you would still be able to execute because obviously you want to be able to commit. You want that query to work, whatever you want to have happen, happen. Yeah. But physically after the force, you, there's actually nothing you can do. So you have to block it at that stage. Right. I'll and just, that would happen down in ODPIC. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. just briefly add, I hope I described this right, but uh, good application design is also important here. I think the majority of the time folks are using Node to create APIs and such. That's what Node is good at, networking. So yeah. when you consider that you have to, you have two things going on here. You have your web server and you have your connection pool. The way I design my apps, I create that connection pool before I open up HTTP access via the web server so that the web server can immediately start serving and seeing those requests once it's up. 
right? Likewise, when you're shutting down, when, when you're using something like uh, the Express Web Server and you call close on that, what you're really doing is, is not closing the server. In other words, if there are existing HTTP connections that are being serviced, then you're not severing those connections. What you're doing is preventing new connections. So you've already solved half the problem. No new connections are coming in once you start the shutdown on the web server. Now, when the close event fires, that means that they've all been serviced. And so if you ever get to that point, then you can shut down your, your connection pool knowing that there are no HTTP connections, everybody's happy, now you just shut this thing down and you're, and you're done with the server. I guess the only issue, if, if that were the case, if you set your app up that way, is you, know, you call close, but there's this really long running query over here that never stops with the connection pool. And so at that point, option one here looks really nice to me because I've already done the waiting and now I'm just ready to shut it down no matter what. But of course, I'd need to think about it a little bit more. Yeah, the option one is marginally more complex because you've got to skip some of this logic. Oh. Option two is just you know, reusing exactly the same logic. I don't think it's that big a deal actually, but it's just, yeah. The, the code would, would immediately would check anyway internally. Are there any connections in use? If there aren't any, yeah. it could immediately call close the normal way. It's only yeah. if there are connections in use, then you want to say, you know, make it so that no further connections can be done and have a drain time. Yeah, yeah. So this this logic is yeah maybe not how you code it, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Mm, I see. I think I misread it. Yeah. If there's if there's no connections in use, there's no point in implementing a drain time or any of that kind of stuff. You right. Just bring it down immediately in the normal way. Return, return back to the command line prompt, and the administrator knows they can go and do their maintenance on the system. Yeah. Right. So yeah, there's all sorts of subtle things here in terms of implementation so that in the end, it'll just sort of do what I mean, just work and, and be nice. So um, that's it. So let's just hop back into the, the bigger picture question, Janelo. Um, you, you do know where to find us if you, you want to ask questions. And that was the question about public roadmap. I was kind of saying it's, it's seat of the pants, you know, what else have we got on? What customer issues are coming in? Everybody who has an install question just takes away our uh, resources from actually doing work, et cetera. We are going to come out with a 3.0, just decided to bump up. There is one big new feature, which I, I don't want to talk about yet, which is going to land in that. And that's where a lot of our work has gone on. So, so sorry, Danilo, you just have to be wait in suspense for us to, to announce that. It does mean we're probably not going to do a lot more than you're actually seeing here in this. Uh, obviously, if you, the more pull requests you submit, Danilo, the more, more things will actually get in. Um, <laughs> so, and obviously, everybody else, of course. So we we did have various things we were kind of playing around with, you know, from sharding support to reworking some of the the bind bind logic, I guess, the uh, uh, namespace as well, so that setting those attributes, we had a proper hierarchy or defined hierarchy of setting those Oracle DB properties from Oracle DB space into the create pool space and the create connection space. Some of those things which may or may not have been slightly backward incompatible or you know just slightly attractive to people we might have stuck in the 3.0 we're sadly not going to get through that yeah. i don't think because we want to get this out you know well in time as we approach our big summer season and then the big oracle world conference is coming up in october and everybody gets really busy so we're just trying to get something out there which we can have a nice stable release maybe get another couple of point releases in before open world Danilo, do you have any uh, particular things you would like to see? Um, aside from the connection pool closing, which I'm working myself, there are some others which I'd like to see, like the support of complex types, complex field SQL types, that's nice as well. Yeah. yeah. And also some integration with common libraries that do logging, like debug and onion and other famous NoDB logging libraries that would be nice as well yeah i think the key so, to logging is going to be as far as the drive is concerned is adding events right uh that's the core to get logging to work the only issue we've had with adding any kind of event support thus far has been you know you have synchronous events and you have asynchronous events and Node does not have support built in in core for async events. And the way I guess to describe that would be um, 
you know, you call get connection and a connection comes in. And so you're going to fire an event, right? There's a new connection, but you're given this resource and maybe you manipulate the resource. And so there may be more than one event listener. And of course, according to the binding of the event, that that resource would need to bubble up, but the next binding can't uh, get to the modifications that were done in the first because everything's synchronous right now. Maybe there is, in fact, a module in user land that adds async support for events. It's modeled on the, the synchronous support that's uh, there right now in core. I was always hoping that they would drop it into core by now, and then we could just do it nice and cleanly. Uh, we don't generally like to add dependencies if they're not needed uh, for security reasons, but that's, that's been the, the holdup for that. The other thing about logging is that kind of app level logging, maybe connection call logging, you could possibly do in the JavaScript layer. So it could be simple for anybody with some JavaScript experience to contribute there. As long as it's, maybe we should just add the events for synchronous, synchronous event support and, and add async event support in the future. See if we can plan that out so they would be backward compatible with each other. Yep. Um, we did have another request for the advanced queue support. So we started that obviously with the, the well not obviously, but with the uh, continuous query notification of the last release. A lot of the groundwork for this has gone in. Um, so this is something which is not super difficult to do, but obviously we need to, to, to find some kind of interfaces, make sure it all works, put some load testing resources behind it, et cetera. So that's also bubbled up. And then the big one I think you did actually mention is this whole you know, binding for, for types. And that's a big project. So Anthony, I forget you kind of specced it out. Was that a month's work or something? I forget what that yeah, was. Yeah, that'd be about right. Wow. A month's work, meaning a month's month. The, the coding and the testing, you know, that's, that's where the coding is probably not as bad as uh, all the testing and documentation that goes with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and that, that's a month of not doing anything else, not working on the Python driver or DPI or the other internal things or the other bits and pieces Anthony's doing. So anyway, so that's, uh, that is a big project, but we, we do know people have asked for that. We will get there. We will get there. So that's about it. So the roadmap is flexible. It's really predicated mostly by what users want. Every now and again, we have something big like this thing I've mentioned for 3.0, which will land which comes along and uh, we want to do that. And then it's just incremental changes each release, as you saw when I showed the, the change note a little bit earlier, bug fixes, et cetera. Why don't we wrap up? Cool. Yeah, I don't see any other questions in the queue. So to say thanks everybody for joining us today. Of course, we'll meet again in about another month. Mm -hmm. Don't have a topic chosen at the moment. So if anybody has any ideas, feel free to suggest them either via issues in GitHub or perhaps via the office hours page. You can submit questions. Feel free to submit them that way. Otherwise, we'll pick one in the coming weeks and we hope to see you in about a month. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.